Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Uh, this is going to be a treat. Uh, it's my 30th anniversary here this week, actually uh, recording this on December the 13th of uh, 2021, so it, it actually has been 30 years to the day. Uh, we're going to be celebrating all week long, celebrating with our friends at the Maryland Lottery. We're going to be letting ourselves play over at Costas uh, for some crab imperial and some deliciousness and some guests and some friends. And if I could bring everyone together on under one roof, this would be the first guy because um, this guy sort of inspired it all at WNST and my weird, nasty nester uh, of, of, of legacy and everything that's gone on over 30 years. He was the one that said, hey, Nestor, I'm doing a show. You want to come in? Come on in. We'll take calls. Kenny Albert joins us now from uh, Parts Unknown, somewhere near the Big Apple after calling Falcons and Panthers and on to the next assignment and probably doing three Rangers games this week. Dude, I love you. I appreciate you making a little time for coming on, and uh, I love that NHL jersey you have out on the, uh, on the Zoomer today. Well, first of all, Nestor, hard to believe it's 30 years. Where is all the time gone? You don't look a day over 29. You look exactly as you did 30 years ago today, and uh, I remember that day well. Uh, we had gotten to know each other. I was doing the Baltimore Skipjack games on the radio. You were covering the team for the Evening Sun. We met at the first press conference uh, when I was down in Baltimore in June, late June of 1990, about a year and a half prior. And uh, you were a frequent between periods guest on the radio broadcast. So, well, it was uh, either me or the popcorn vendor most nights. Right, exactly. So, and you, <laughs> you, you made it down the steps to the broadcast booth a lot easier than the popcorn vendor, if you remember. Uh, where we were located. It was a cage. Everybody knows. I mean, everybody's been to the Royal Farms Arena, but not a lot of folks realize between the decks of the 200, 300 level, the lower and upper level, there are cages that literally were built for the purpose of housing, literally, your father to call Nick's Bullets games, right? Literally. And it was a great spot for hockey. It was a little little off to the left on the blue line, but it was a great spot to see the game. And you had to climb over. You had to lift your leg over and go down a ladder. Let me ask you this. uh, Have you ever sat in a better seat calling a game to see the game? Because, I mean, that's what you do for a living. You don't watch it on – we watch you watch it on TV, but you're literally looking at it from a perch and a long way away in most cases, right? Like, I mean – That was one of the better spots uh, when I think back. The old Boston Garden, I only worked one game there, the Capitals-Bruins game. Uh, I might have to put that a little bit ahead because it was at center ice in a similar position. Uh, the Bell Center in Montreal, it's an overhang and you're looking right down on the ice. But I put the Baltimore Arena uh, right up there in the top five for sure. We call it the Royal Farms Arena Royal now, Farms real Arena. Friend. Well, and, and we're sponsored, of course. Do so we come down and get you some fried chicken? Kenny um, invited me onto his show as a reporter 30 years ago, literally today. And 30 years later, I think about being syndicated, all this crazy stuff I've done in my marriage and work I've done and my brand shift to Baltimore Positive. But dude, I I don't even, I'll be talking about me and all this stuff all week long and what I've been doing the last 30 years. But man, your journey's really been something. And I, um, people ask me about it and I, I want to make sure I get the details right because you were... You came to the Skipjacks, and I did you always dream of doing Nick's range or like following your dad's thing? Because I was never really sure at that point that you weren't going to go be the voice of the Dodgers or something in base or you know, some other place that hasn't been so close. I mean, your life has been it's been incredible to follow you and to know that you sort of begat me here and whatever I've done. But you're in everyone's face every weekend, NFL, from the very beginning at Fox. You called like this seminal. You've called more football games than anybody over the last three decades, right? Uh, somebody actually keeps a list. I, I'm not right <laughs> at the top, but uh, there, there's an Internet site that does keep track of how many uh, NFL and NBA, NHL, MLB games. Al Michaels is at the top of the list, and there are a couple of others. But I actually hit 450 recently, believe it or not, 450 NFL TV broadcast since since September of ninety four. I think it's I think it's eighth all time on this list. Well, I mean that the, the whole notion that during that period of time you started in Baltimore as sort of your job was sort of a PR job in that department as well. Um, Terry Ficarelli, who preceded you in some way, and uh, and uh, your fire on ice and all the stuff that came before you with Gene Ubriaco and the announcers. 
you came in, you were 21 maybe and left when you were 23 or 24, but home team sports and T.O.P. and Washington was sort of a next stop for you. So it wasn't sort of predetermined that you were going to go back to New York, right? No, not at all. Uh, I love the five years down in Maryland, the two years in Baltimore, and then the three years in Washington. I thought I would be down there for a long time. And then uh, due to a number of circumstances and domino effect, um, I wound up moving back to New York and, and starting with the Rangers on the radio side in 95. But um, my goal was always to do hockey on the radio. That was what I wanted to do throughout high school and college. And I uh, was so fortunate to fill in on four New York Islanders radio games in 1989 and 90. And I was able to use that tape uh, to send around to various minor league teams. Most of the time, Nestor, it's the other way around. You get a minor league job, hopefully, at some point, and then you use that tape to try and get an NHL job. Well, actually, uh, let me just I speak to that. Islander because, tape in because, 1989. Yeah, play-by-play was something I never thought I could ever be any – I never dreamed of doing it. I just thought it was a different kind of skill set even than doing radio, which I never wanted to do radio, dude. And I, I like, when I found do, you – I could never do what you do. I couldn't do a talk show. Really? No, you – could, dude, you did a talk show. Come on. That's why we brought you. That's why we brought you in. No, no, no. But I would just say this about what you did and what you were good at, and and I mean, all respect, man. You made me feel so comfortable. I felt like when I came into that dingy little five light studio with the cigarettes piled up, and it was just you couldn't even breathe in there in that little room. That I felt like I had a real pilot, like you knew how to land the plane. And I have famously told the story of your father walking out on me. Have I told <laughs> you? I mean, like literally, your father walked out on me the first time I ever did radio. I had no idea what I was doing. But I want to talk about play by play because whenever I heard John Miller talk about it back then, a great Oriole broadcaster, it was always like take your hairbrush in your mirror and call the game. Or go out and sit in left field of Memorial Stadium with your little tape recorder, right? And your little microphone, which were little microphones back in the 80s, our age, right? And practice calling the game for real. That's what broadcasters, that's what Chuck Thompson would give a little Nestor advice if he was 13 and wanted to be Marv Albert or Steve Albert or Kenny Albert or any of the Alberts, right? But but I, I, I never took that on. How did... For you and your dad, how did you make that tape? And what was your, other than listening to dad, your indoctrination into doing play-by-play, watching it and talking about it as it happens? Because it is a skill set. I had Paul Allen on talking about horse racing and calling a horse race. It's just so, so different to me. It's so hard what you do, man. Yeah, I don't know if I can call a horse race. But for <laughs> me, it started when I was five or six years old. And my parents gave me a tape recorder for my birthday. And I set up my room like a radio and TV studio. I had the desk and I had the bed in the middle and the TV on the other side. I would call games into this tape recorder. I'm sure now kids are doing it into an iPhone, right? And then when I was old enough to start bringing the recorder to Shea Stadium, Madison Square Garden, when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, I would call games into a tape recorder. So I'm not wrong. That is exactly what you did because that's the advice you were given, right? I don't even know if it was advice. I just started doing it. So... The best, and you kept score well, as you did it. Kept score, and the best thing that ever was happened it. Baseball, to me, then baseball is what you started. It was hockey, basketball, baseball. Everything. You did it. At, you did it everywhere. Every sport. But one of the best things that happened to me, Nestor, in high school, a small cable station, Cox Cable of Great Neck, came to my high school in Port Washington. They had a small television van and two cameras, and they were going to film a girls' basketball game. They had no announcers. They were going to show the game on tape, just with the natural sound from the gym. I introduced myself to the producer. I was there covering the game for the school newspaper and he clipped a microphone onto my shirt. The late Roy Menton clipped a mic onto my shirt. I sat in the second row. I called the game. Everybody around me probably thought I was crazy talking to myself in the stands. The next day we spoke on the phone and over the next three years, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, I called 75 or a hundred uh, high school and even division three college basketball, baseball, football, hockey, lacrosse, soccer, every sport imaginable. I would bring friends along as color analysts. And I think those three years, you know, back then, if you wanted to do play by play, you couldn't really start until college at a college radio station. I had a three year head start uh, during my high school days, thanks to Roy Menton and Cox Cable. So from there, uh, went on to school at NYU. We had a really good division three basketball program. My friends and I called the games. As I mentioned, I uh, had the opportunity to fill in on some Islanders radio. 
sent tapes around. I heard the job was open with the Skipjacks. Mike Haynes, who went on to do the Colorado Avalanche for many years, had been the radio announcer in Baltimore for a year or two. Uh, he wound up going elsewhere for whatever reason and uh, sent my tape down. And the late Tom Ebright, who was the owner of the team, along with his wife, Joyce, uh, Jim Riggs and Alan Rackvin, who were in the front office. Um, I flew into Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where Tom Ebright lived, uh, met with Tom and Alan and Jim. And uh, we sat for about two hours and we chatted. And uh, about a week or two later, I was out in Vancouver covering the NHL draft for a small station in New York. And this was before cell phones and before voicemail on, on you know, uh, on a cell phone that you can carry with you. I had an answering machine back home in New York. And every day, about 10 times a day, I would call my answering machine and dial in, put in the code. And finally, on Friday, the day before the 1990 NHL draft, when Yarmir Yager was the fifth overall pick by the Pittsburgh Penguins, in the afternoon, I received a voicemail when I, when I called into my answering machine uh, from the Skipjacks that I have been hired. And it was such a great day. Uh, it was a month after I graduated from college. And I wouldn't trade into two years in Baltimore for anything. Uh, you mentioned some of the other aspects that were involved in the job. I was hired first and foremost to be the radio broadcaster, but also had to assist in public relations and sales and marketing and picking up players at the airport and wound up doing the radio show because the station that the games were on, um, as you mentioned, the second year, first year we were on WLIF, and then we transferred over to WITH. And uh, Jim Ward, who was a sales uh, salesman at the station, big Philadelphia uh, guy, Jim Ward. Yeah. He wanted to fill some airtime in the, in the hours leading up to the game. So, uh, he talked to me, uh, I brought in Jerry Coleman, who, you know, well, who's still on the air in Baltimore. And he was sort of my co-host and salesperson. And then when hockey season started, I had to go on the road with the skip Jacks, So we needed somebody else, uh, to help out and, and join the show. And that's where you came in. You had been a frequent guest in between periods on skip Jacks hockey. So, uh, it, it was a perfect marriage. You came in and, uh, you know, wound up taking over the show eventually and the rest is history. Well, I wondered in the beginning, first off, I never listened to sports radio, right? Like, so it was not my thing. I had listened to Phil Wood a little bit after Skipjack game long before you came along. I, I mean, I remember the day I moved to Baltimore, June 29th, 1990, uh, flipping around the dial, listening to John Miller on an Orioles game. Uh, and then listening to both Phil Wood and Stan Charles on the radio that night. I'll, I'll never forget it. My first night, I lived up in Owings Mills. I don't even know if I had electricity yet. I had some kind of a transistor radio. I bought a bed that day and a TV, and I listened to Phil Wood and Stan Charles on the radio that night. Well, see, that wasn't me, right? I was going to games. I, I liked we rock going and to roll. Concerts. Yeah, I was a music critic at that time. I covered a lot of high school sports, 88, 89, 90, uh, high school softball, girls uh, basketball, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but for me, I, my life changed Thanksgiving weekend of 91. I went into work and the union had offered to buy out people. And I had been trying to leave Baltimore. Right, yeah, I I had been trying to leave Baltimore, right? I I had been sending resumes all over the country trying to find a pathway like you where somebody would give me a better shot than what I already had at the Sun, which at the Sun, I was an agit clerk. I had done a lot of reporting, but I was not a reporter. And that was more like you had to go to Maryland and go go different places. I went to the University of Baltimore. They helped me pay for college. But all I wanted to do was leave the Baltimore Sun. All I wanted to do after six years of being there and being hired as a 17-year-old kid and being still thought of, all these years later, I run into people who still treat me like I'm 17, literally, right? Uh, ran into one a couple of weeks ago at the, at the Hippodrome who still thinks I'm 17. I'm 53. So um, I wanted to leave the Sun. And Ken Rosenthal was there, obviously. Richard Justice had come and left. But, I mean, great, great. Buster Olney, I mean, just uh, Tim Kirchin. I mean, all these people had been in my newsroom at the same time. But Phil Jackman was my my best friend. And Mike Marlowe and, and Bob Nuscard as well on, on the news side. But Phil was the guy who would pick me up. We went to Caps games together all the time. And went to Bullets games together all the time. And... Uh, we were friends, and he listened to sports radio. He listened to Rex Barney on the way to or whoever was in, and he did sports radio. So Phil would fill in on we ah, filling in, filling in this weekend. And um, 
But I never, I, mean, I really, he and I, we, we bullshit when we were in the car. We didn't, li- we listen and he'd yell, ah, that's hot shit. You know, he'd yell at the, at, at the dash sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, it was never my thing. And certainly after the games, maybe we would put the post game on, you know, after a Caps game leaving. But we would wind up turning it down, commercials, and he and I would wind up talking for 40 minutes. So we didn't even listen to it. So you guys, I didn't you, have. You, you were doing your own talk show with Phil. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would say for sure. But so I didn't have a style, bro. You know that. I was, it was just me. And when you asked me to come in and do the games, I felt like I was in the captain's seat. Like you knew what you were doing. Like you were a real symphony. And you convinced me I knew how to play in the band to some degree. And the fact that I knew a lot about the hockey team, a lot about the history of the team, that I was in the locker room a lot, knew – I mean I really cared. I, I cared a lot about the Skipjacks and I – I still would if they were. I still care about a lot about the Ravens and what's going on. It's my natural inclination. But the radio side of it, I don't even know why you invited me on. Like <laughs> I didn't really know if I knew enough. And then you know, once I I got in and started captaining it, and you went away, and friggin' Coleman went away, then I felt like I I knew enough. I was confident enough to say I'm good at this, and this is fun and I can make it fun to talk about sports every day which was my grease man maybe a little Howard Stern but I didn't really listen to Stern and I wasn't really like a morning animal shock jock morning zoo all of that was big I wanted to do my own afternoon thing and I, and I don't know that anybody does sports radio the way I've done it for 30 years but I didn't really know how to do it but I sat next to you and I knew you had structure to what you do. I mean, you you said you couldn't do sports radio. That dude, that's not you're you're being unkind to yourself. You would have might have been the greatest well, sports radio host ever because <laughs> of your knowledge. Because you 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 have deep knowledge of in the way that I do too. Just in de- like we grew up sports people and nerds and journalists. And there's a real difference between bloggers when they come on from a, a historical perspective and business and things like that. I mean, I guess I could do sports radio, but my thing was play by play. That's what I always wanted to do. I really enjoyed doing the show in Baltimore for those two years. Um, But I guess I did grow up uh, listening in New York. John Sterling, who's still the voice of the Yankees to this day in his 80s. uh, He was one of the first sports talk show hosts I listened to. He was at WMCA back in the 1970s. Art Rush Jr. on WABC, Dave Sims. And then all of a sudden in July of 1987, I was in college at the time this thing called WFAN started and they were the first Um, I was working as an associate producer for Howie Rose, the great Howie Rose, who's still the voice of the Mets to this day. And one of the best uh, baseball and hockey broadcasters. And if you remember Nestor, he was a frequent guest. He would call into our show uh, back in the early nineties from New York. He was one of our early guests, but um, I learned so much from Howie. I was his associate producer on Mets extra, which is the pre and post game show. And it was one of the first of its kind. And from 1987 through early 90, before I moved to Baltimore, I worked as Howie's associate producer. I would listen to all of the talk shows on WFAN. And I guess that's where maybe I gained the knowledge of how to do a sports talk show. And I did use a lot of my contacts from New York. Uh, dude, I arrange, watched you produce, guests, and I do. I thirty years later, day. dude. Every day, I would go into that dingy little room, and you would be working the phones <laughs> to try to get a Jack Buck on, to try to get Sonny Jurgensen on, to try to get anybody you knew. And in like, I was always amazed. Like, you never like used your dad or like whatever. It was like you were a hustler, like I was a hustler at the News American, trying to get Chris Berman on the phone to get a quote for Sports First for something. Watching Phil Jackman work the TV repairman, getting to know every Barry Gould and every Helene Elliott and every yeah. you know reporter that would come in on the hockey beat and then the basketball beat and you know sitting next to Mike Wilbon at the spectrum and watching Dr. J play just like people and and the Rolodex and who would make an interesting guess because they would know a lot right like you tried to call people that knew a lot and that's what made your show good and that's you taught me how to do that and there was Kenny there was no handbook on how to do this man and 30 years later I've had so many 
parents come to me with their kids and say, make my kid a nasty nester, make my kid a Kenny Albert, make, you know, get my kid on the radio, get my kid on television, get my kid into sports journalism or this or that. I don't even know what to say to them because I didn't follow any traditional path other than really pissing a lot of people off, you know? (laughs) And if I remember correctly, we did have Jack Buck on and we had so many other guests and I felt like it was important for people to hear uh, some of the greats from the world of sports, whether it was broadcasting, writing, coaches. We had Barry Trotz in studio, who's gone on to be one of the best coaches in National Hockey League history, is the third winningest coach all time, won a Stanley Cup a couple of years ago. He was in studio with us in Baltimore and uh, both you and I were able to use some of those contacts to arrange these guests and it was, it was a much different time. It was a much simpler time back then, right? No internet, uh, no cell phones, no computers. So, uh, you know, for us at the time, you know, we, w- we would try to get on as many of those folks as possible. And a lot of the media members from the Washington and Baltimore area. And uh, there are just some great memories from all of those shows we did back in 91 and 92. Kenny Albert is here. Um, we are structure free here on my 30th anniversary. Uh, you know, our time's short. You got a lot of games to call here. How many games you, a week are you calling these days? I mean, it feels like you're omnipresent, and um, I can't imagine anyone having. I have a friend who had a million Marriott miles, literally, <laughs> and, you know, g- gifted them to a, a grand wish and, like, really incredible stuff because he's traveled the world. I-, I can't imagine anybody flies and moves around a little bit more than you do and how structured your life is. So I really do appreciate you taking some downtime away from your family to, to reminisce a little bit, man. But you're busy. Well, I do have a lot of miles. This time of year is pretty hectic with the NHL, NFL. NBA crossover. I work about 15 to 20 Knicks games on MSG over the course of the year when Mike Breen's on a national assignment. So I happen to have three last week, believe it or not, in San Antonio, Indiana, and Toronto. Uh, Had three straight weeks of both West Coast hockey and football. So a lot of flying back and forth. Stayed out in Seattle uh, one of the weeks, but otherwise a couple of red eyes here and there. Um, Never feel like I'm going to work. I'm sure you're the same way, even though there's a lot of work and for me travel that goes into it. Um, there's never a day where I feel like I'm actually going to work, uh, despite all the preparation and, and the travel, like I said, uh, I get to call games for a living. And like I mentioned earlier, it's over 450 in the NFL, uh, probably 1500 to 2000 in the NHL. And, uh, again, have never felt the list of your color analyst would be unbelievable, right? Like I have that that list. I do have a, that's an unbelievable. And if you could bring though, the living people together into one room, right? Like literally that would be one heck of a collection of humans. If we ever, if we do, if we ever get to honor you for anything, if your family ever does something that makes you cry and I don't get invited, I'm going to be pissed because I want to be there for that. By the way, you are on my list of color analysts because you did a skipjacks game with me. So you're one of the 250 or so who are on the list. But, you know, I'm looking up at my wall and photos with Jim Palmer from the home team sports days, Howie Long, Terry Bradshaw, Tim McCarver, Patrick Ewing was a color analyst. So there are some incredible names on the list. Uh, Jim Cott uh, will be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. That was announced last week. I think I worked about six innings with him, uh, two innings a piece on three separate games. Uh, Bert Blylevin, who's a Hall of Famer. Paul Molitor. Circle me. Did, did Bert circle you? Did you? Did, did, no? No chance of that? He circled me on the screen. He did. He well, did if, if Bert doesn't circle you, it's not legitimate, man. No Billy doubt Ripken. about it. I worked a couple of games with Billy Ripken. So great, great memories, no matter the sport, no matter who the color analyst was. And the list is right at around 250 of all-time color analysts in the various sports. I feel the same way, right? Like Joe Buck sat in the window at Mickey Mantle's and hung out with me for three hours. When Craig Sager passed, Craig would make time in New York, Bert Show. All these people I've touched over 30 years and have pictures and video. I mean, Maureen McCormick was shouting me out last <laughs> week, right? I mean, like, we've, I, I, and I have it all. That's and funny I, you I, mentioned that. I met the last Orioles game I did a couple of years ago. We had Barry Williams in the booth that day. I, right. And Barry Williams has called into the show uh, over the years. Susan Olsen has called in. So we've had all of these Billy Joel twice. You know what I mean? Like, and I know you rode the elevator famously with Billy Joel. We should go to a show together. You and me at the That's garden. Funny. I don't know like, how you remember should... that. Well, yeah, you, you always say, so I have a couple of, I don't have a lot of pictures of you and me. These are the two that I have. So here's one for you. All right. Super and, Bowl in Atlanta. The, Super Bowl, I'm wearing my oiler gear. Right. So, and then I have one more that I'm going to share out. And this was literally the Mets 
preseason game. You yep. see the HTS in the back. S- serious skip jacks here. And a beautiful Nautica jacket that Gary Fisher gave me, which I pronounced. I, know, I, noticed, I noticed you cut Coleman out of this Yeah, photo. dude, you know, it, it's, it, you know, when, yeah, I'm not even going to go. I'm not no, even going to. I, I have both of those as well. That, that, that was the first game at Camden Yards. And ironically, Jeff Torborg, who I went on to work many games with, was managing the Mets that day. Well, there Speaking you go. Sid Fernandez partner. pitched as well, as I remember, yeah. right? Yeah. Sudden Sid. Well, uh, Kenny, I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, you know, and watching you, there's a piece of me that's in Carolina or Atlanta or Green Bay or wherever you are, and I'm I'm watching Hanson go all red zone on me now, you know, since my back blew out and I'm not traveling as much this year. And, you know, I see the cut in and I'm like, that's my dude. He's calling the game. He's doing what he loves to do. And I, when I think of all the people in the world that I've ever met that have like lived a dream that I knew you when and you're on this journey and you're having a great time, I, you know, I hope the Rangers win again for you. Maybe one day for you. They're having a great season so far, so we'll see what happens this year. One more thing. When you reference the early 90s, I work with Jonathan Vilma, uh, the great New Orleans Saint linebacker, Super Bowl champion, perennial pro bowler. Something came up on our broadcast yesterday about the first year of Fox Sports, 1994, and I was a part of that. And JV mentioned uh, on the air yesterday, he said, 1994, I was 12 years old then, which means he was nine when we started doing this together. So uh, I kind of run the gamut of partners and color analysts of of all ages. But um, on a serious note, 30 years, hard to believe. Today's the actual day as we tape this, December 13th. Happy anniversary. Uh, again, have such great memories of working in Baltimore with you and with Coleman and with all of the others. You and I met uh, June of 90, the press conference, which introduced Robbie Laird as the Skipjacks head coach. I was there introduced as the radio broadcaster, and we met there for the first time and hard to believe it's 31 years, but uh, always love catching up and uh, reminiscing. And hopefully we can do it again soon and not wait until the 40th anniversary. Oh, you'll be calling a game in the state of Maryland sometime soon. Uh, he hits them all. So. Kenny so. Albert is here, the man, the myth, the legend, and a great NHL jersey behind him. Uh, I Room Raider gives you an 8.5, especially on the Naughty Pine. I love the paneling back there, Kenny. Old that school was office That man. was here when I moved in 21 years ago. Haven't touched it. It, it looks like... Kennedy sat there. (laughs) (laughs) He he very well may have. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) All the Kennedys sat there. Kenny Albert uh, joins us here uh, on the 30th anniversary, uh, moving from game to game and Rangers to Rangers. And uh, we're going to be moving over to Costas and having some crab cakes. I owe Kenny a crab cake on the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery. Well, we've been letting ourselves. I've been eating a lot of crab cakes this year. Uh, So when you get down here, I'll have some recommendations. We're going to take you over to Fadley's, get you to Costas. Uh, Make sure you don't have tourist crab cakes when you're in town. (laughs) I am Nestor. We are WNST. 1570 Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore positive.